everybody, welcome back to the Sunny Day Review. I'm Brian. I'm Jillian. Jillian, how you doing? We're covering Angel again. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> I know I know it's not your favorite thing yet, but but we're getting closer to episodes you like, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, Room with a View, the first episode we're talking about today, I actually kind of like that episode. It's a very uh, cordy centric episode. Yes. I love seeing uh, the Queen Bee back. So. <laughs> oh, man. Well, let's let's just jump into it. My, my cat be, might be about to knock down my one and only decoration. Oh, no, forget it. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> just wanted to throw everyone off. <laughs> it's like, this is the one thing I have set up for this podcast. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay. Uh, sorry. So, Room with a View, spelt in the way that uh, I guess it would have been spelt out in, like, a newspaper when they used to uh, do, like, charging by the letter. Oh, so, okay. like, you and I never really grew up in this time. Everything no. was listed online. But uh, apparently in 99, when mm-hmm. there were uh, apartments open for rent, mm-hmm. the... Oh, what is it? The advertisements in the newspaper yeah, the would be charged. Section. Yeah, you'd yeah. get charged by the letter. Oh, so, yeah. in order to save some money, uh, usually they kind of, I think of it as like text speech. You know, mm-hmm. like when you used to yep. ha- only mm-hmm. have like, what was it? How many characters? Like 120 characters yeah, or something? Yeah, uh, Yeah, I, I'm mixing up with Twitter, I'm sure, but not a lot. No. So, like when you said. maybe? Something like that. When you used yeah. to have to make your text as like short as possible, but get the mm. most amount of information conveyed. So this uh, episode is actually spelled R M W slash A V U, which is room with a view, which took me forever to figure out. <laughs> I was very confused when this would get uh, recorded on my TiVo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. what, is, what is this? I'm like, did they just type it in wrong? Like, that's mm-hmm. not English. I don't understand. <laughs> but yeah, um, so anyway, in today's video, we're going to be talking about Room with a View and Sense and Sensitivity. So uh, season one, episodes five and six. Uh, starting that's off, right. yeah, starting off with Room with a View, season one, episode five, originally aired November 2nd, 1999, written by uh, David Greenwald and Jane Espenson and directed by Scott McGinnis. All right, so pretty good writers. Yep. Yeah, this is should be a good episode. We'll see. <laughs> uh, so let's see. The episode begins with Cordy reenacting a failed audition uh, that she went on to Doyle. He's actually really nice to her and tells her that he can't believe she didn't get the part. Uh, Cordelia vents frustration to him about how uh, how much she dislikes her apartment, and he offers to let her stay over at his place if she ever finds herself needing a night away from her awful apartment. Uh, she turns him <laughs> down, then heads out. Which what we've seen of Doyle's apartment is not like that big of a step up. You know? Yeah, but her apartment has uh, brown exploding water and lots and lots of cockroaches. So, That's I mean, his, his place was just kind of, like, dirty. Yeah, maybe it's more on him. Yeah, yeah. her place is infested and broken. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Um, I mean, hey, if I was her, I would want to get out of there as fast as possible, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's see. Doyle talks to Angel to try to get some background on Cordy. Uh, Angel says that Cordelia's group in high school was called the Cordettes. I don't think that was ever referred to on Buffy. No. I don't think so, either. I'm also sure, or I'm also not sure why Angel would know that. (laughs) Um, unless it was, like, one of those times when, you know, he was in her car with her and she was just talking about herself as she mm-hmm. tends to do. Right. And like was trying yeah, maybe like the, the body episode with the all the body parts when the drove. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Um <laughs> I-, I love how she's like, Angel, like, come home with me or whatever. <laughs> she's like she's like, drive me home, but it's her car. It's yeah. like what do you do for him to do when he gets there? But yeah, anyway, um so yeah, I don't know if maybe that was just like her way of like bragging to him that like oh mm-hmm. i have my own posse and i'm the leader and stuff like that but i'm like yeah that was never brought up on buffy so just kind of an odd thing that i picked up on right um but yeah so angel basically fills doyle and the audience for anybody who didn't watch buffy on cordelia's kind of riches to rag story uh <laughs> right. he leaves he leaves out the part where her parents lost everything due to not paying their taxes but you get the gist mm-hmm. 
Um, Cordelia returns home to her rundown apartment to find that the cockroach problem has exploded. Uh, her water is brown and basically everything is broken. Cordy calls Doyle to ask for a place to stay for the night, but he misses the call due to a demon who had broken into his apartment looking to collect on a debt. It's a pretty classic Doyle situation there. Um, yeah. Getting <laughs> shaken down. <laughs> Uh, Cordelia is so grossed out by her apartment that she invites herself to stay at Angel's. Uh, we get a pretty awesome shirtless scene with David Boreas. <laughs> uh, I, I had to note. I couldn't leave it out. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Cordelia basically just complains and invites herself to stay until either her place gets cleaned up or, um, or and is livable again or she can find a new place. Angel allows this for some reason and even gives her his bed. Listen, Angel um, is not a confrontational guy. <laughs> I, I literally have in my notes, I think Angel has boundary issues mm -hmm. in, in the way of he doesn't set them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Angel's, like, basement apartment, though, is pretty nice. It really is. So um, I understand why she chose that over Doyle's place. She didn't choose it over Doyle's place, though. She called Doyle first, and he didn't pick up. Oh, all right. Good point. Fair, fair enough. She invited herself over to Angel's. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, so let's see. The next morning, Doyle shows up and is looking pretty shaky. Uh, he's, he's clearly been on the run and hiding all night from the demon that was after him looking for money. He goes to talk to Angel, finding Cordelia in a bathrobe at the kitchen table. He thinks Angel slept with Cordy and is very upset because Angel is his friend and asks Angel how could he do such a thing. Angel explains what's really going on. Mm -hmm. I love this too because this is a scene, right, where she's like, "I think there's peanut butter on your bed, like the sheets." <laughs> He's like, "That's not possible. I don't eat food." Like, <laughs> well, no, because, uh, yeah, he comes out and is like, "You got peanut butter on the bed," and she's yeah, like, "She's like, mm, are you sure?" <laughs> and he's like, "Yeah, I'm pretty sure." She goes in, takes a look, comes back out, and she's like. I don't know what you've been doing, Angel, but you somehow got peanut butter on the bed. And he's like, that's <laughs> literally not possible. I don't eat. Oh, man. But yeah, it's it just kind of shows you that rather than taking responsibility, she will just kind of lie. <laughs> Which is not okay, but, you know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Doyle takes all, like, this whole conversation as, like, you guys slept They're together? They're doing something like, else with what? the peanut butter, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, let's see. Angel notices a bruise on Doyle's hand, a souvenir from his altercation with the demon in his apartment the night before. Angel tells Doyle there's someone at the office to see him. Doyle says he'll be right up, but instead sprints out the back door where <laughs> we find Angel waiting for him. <laughs> it, it's kind of a great scene. It's like, mm. Doyle's like, okay, I'll be right up. Angel goes back up the stairs and he just sprints out the door. And then all of a sudden, Angel's there. Um... <laughs> Doyle fills Angel in on the situation. Angel agrees to help him with the demon um, to get him to leave him alone if Doyle will help Cordelia find an apartment. <laughs> Angel's like, violence, I got this. Uh, apartment hunting, absolutely not. Sounds Well, awful. I mean, no, it would be hard for Angel to help because he can't go out in the daylight. That's, that's also true. I bet. But he's, he finds a way to get around pretty well, I mean. <laughs> yeah, but he's like, here, you help me with my Cordelia problem, I will help you with your demon looking for money problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's see. Uh, we get a montage of Doyle and Cordy looking at apartments, everything from disgusting to creepy to downright inappropriate. <laughs> Cordy finally breaks down and agrees to see a place that Dor Doyle heard of. Uh, apparently he has a guy. Um, of course. We go to the apartment and it's gorgeous and more importantly, rent controlled. Very important. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cordelia agrees to take the apartment and then, um, starts talking about how she wants to take out a wall. I don't think she understands that renting usually doesn't allow you to make major structural change, major structural changes to a unit, but, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, sure. Uh, yeah. And we don't know, Cord do you know if that is like a oh, load bearing wall? What's the, you know? You gotta get a contractor in to find out mm -hmm. if it's a load bearing wall, but even then you're not supposed to make major structural changes to an a, <laughs> to an apartment that you're renting. Right. My last apartment they wouldn't even let me paint the walls. Yeah, it's a, it's an outrageous request. I don't know. Okay. My actually my last apartment wouldn't let me use command strips. 
there's, there was what? literally yeah there was literally something That's in the insane. lease that was like you cannot use any sort of adhesive anything on the walls including uh command strips so every every hook that i wanted to put up to hang something mm -hmm. had to be nailed into the wall <laughs> it's so weird that they're like hooks are fine but command strips are not well it was like hooks as long as the like the screw isn't bigger than your pinky or something they didn't want people like mounting TVs into the wall, mm -hmm. but if you wanted to like hang pictures or whatever, it was fine. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. It was weird. Um, but yeah, I digress. <laughs> um, so let's see. Cordy and Doyle leave, uh, and we see a human-like face emerge from the wall. So um, maybe this farm isn't so perfect. Yeah, there's maybe a reason that it was on the market for for a while. Yeah. Uh, Angel pummels the demon that was after Doyle, then agrees that Doyle will pay the money, uh, saving Doyle's life since the demon was out for blood. <laughs> uh, that seemed to have escalated pretty quickly between I'm looking for money and we want to kill Doyle. If you mm. kill him, you don't get your money, which is exactly the point that Angel makes and then says that uh, Doyle will repay him. I, I don't know. I feel weird about Angel agreeing that Doyle will repay the money and then going to Doyle and being like, you need to repay the money. And Doyle's like, the entire point is that I don't have the money. <laughs> so. <laughs> I mean, I guess it shows what Angel thinks of Doyle. It's like, Doyle's clearly lying. He clearly has the money. And Doyle's like, no, I really, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um. There's a conversation that happens at some point where, like, Angel's like, why do you live your life this way? And Doyle's like, <laughs> the kind of life that you live where you, it doesn't let your expectations in life get too high. Mm. But it's That's like, a fair dude, point, I guess. Eh. I don't know why he thinks he has a shot with Cordelia, though. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> like, it seems like the guy can't even afford toilet paper. <laughs> but yeah, um, so let's see. So we see that Cordy's apartment is haunted. Uh, Cordy tries to convince herself that it's not while weird things like her bed floating keep happening. Uh, later, Doyle and Angel come to visit after uh, er, and bring like housewarming gifts. Mm -hmm. And Cordelia tries to tell them that everything is fine until the walls start leaking blood. <laughs> uh, Angel and Doyle try to convince her that the apartment is haunted, but Cordy doesn't want to give it up. Uh, they convince her that they can do a cleansing spell to get rid of the ghost. Yeah, I mean, I I get it, but, you know. I mean, well, maybe she's like cockroaches, ghosts. What's the difference at this point? A little leaking blood, it's fine. Yeah, it's whatever. Take that over the gross water. Yeah, at least it has water. Mm -hmm. Not sludge. Um, The gang head back to the office and come up with a game plan. Uh, They each take off to get their piece of the spell. Cordy gets a call from Angel saying to meet her back at her apartment. When she gets there, it turns out the ghost of a scary dead woman is able to fake Angel's voice, dial a phone, and has lured Cordy back to her funhouse. Yeah. I want to know, one, how did she know the number of Angel investigations? That's, Two, uh, yeah. how did she manage to pick up and dial a phone? I don't know. Maybe there's the business cards around. Maybe. She's like, I don't understand what this logo is, but think this might be where she works <laughs> <laughs> um let's see the ghost tries to hang cordelia while emotionally manipulating her feeding on every insecurity and vulnerability um say and basically like saying all of the bad things that she thinks about herself back to her mm -hmm. um let's see angel and doyle show up saving cordelia from physical danger um and start the cleansing spell while cordelia cries on the floor still being tormented by the ghost the gang of three, a uh, gang of three demons shows up looking for Doyle, uh, and the money that he owes them. It's really not important, and they only serve to distract Angel and Doyle. Uh, the ghost pulls Cordelia into the bedroom, locks her in. Uh, she starts toying with Cordelia again, saying, or uh, trying to convince her to kill herself, but calls her a bitch, and a light switch seems to go off in Cordelia's <laughs> head, and she goes full on Queen Bee Cordelia on her. <laughs> Uh, Cordelia finds her inner mean girl power, tells the ghost lady to back off, causing her to get somewhat vanquished somehow. Um, Cordy goes back into the living room, tells Angel and Doyle that they've won, um, then gets momentarily possessed and takes a lamp to the wall that she wanted to remove at the beginning of the episode. Uh, the lamp breaks the wall and a skeleton is revealed. 
So there was basically a subplot in this entire episode. Um, Angel went to the police office to talk to Kate to learn more about the apartment. Mm -hmm. It's revealed that the ghost lady died and police believe her son did it. Turns out the skeleton in the wall is the ghost lady's son, Dennis. Mm -hmm. uh, the ghost lady had bricked him into the wall because he had told her that he was, he was leaving to live with his girlfriend. The mother bricked him into the wall to prevent him from leaving, causing him to suffocate to death. Uh, once completed, she then almost immediately died of a heart attack. <laughs> Turns out Dennis is also a ghost slash phantom in the apartment, but he doesn't mean any harm and turns into like a pseudo character on the show. Yeah, I like Dennis. Yeah. Dennis likes Cordelia too, so it's like, it works. You know? Yeah. Just roommates. <laughs> Dennis um, is a fun character. Yeah, it is. It's fun. I don't want to get too into it, but how they like do it, like he's not like a ghost that they see, but he like no. influences stuff, moved stuff. Like it is a fun little thing to have. At one point in an episode, like not this episode, but like Cordy is crying and he like picks up a box of tissues and brings it over mm -hmm. to her, and she's like, yeah. "Thanks, Dennis." <laughs> it's fun. So would you would you give this for a rating, and would you say watch or pass? Um. I give this one like a seven. It's okay. not like spectacular, but it's not awful. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's certainly nowhere near I fall to pieces. So. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I feel like that's my new benchmark of horrible. Mm -hmm. um, so so we, yeah. we've officially dethroned I Robot Eugene. Now it's I fall to pieces. Yeah, it's for Angel, it's I fall to pieces. And for Buffy, mm -hmm. it's uh, Go Fish. Right, I forgot yeah. about go fish. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, but I mean, as far as watcher pass, you know what? This it's a kind of fun episode. Mm -hmm. Um, for the ladies out there, you get a shirtless David Boreanaz, so that's nothing to snicker at. Um, and it explains one, uh, Cordy's new apartment. Two, it explains Phantom Dennis, who shows up multiple times, mm -hmm. or doesn't show up, but he's a ghost, but. He's, yeah. he's around and he's referenced enough right. uh, that you would be very confused if you hadn't seen this episode. So this one's a watch for me. Yeah. So I gave this one a six. Um, I like it. It's just like, you know, it's good. It's there. Yeah. I'll watch it, you know. I like I like Dennis, like you said. Um, it's definitely a very low stakes episode. Maybe like one of the most low stakes episodes in either series. Um, yeah. Except that Cordy almost gets hung by a cable out of the ceiling, and uh, right, the, right. the ghost lady is trying to convince her to kill herself. I mean, those are some stakes. Yeah, those are stakes for sure. <laughs> but it's not like a end of the world, no, you know, type no. scenario. So yeah, you know, pretty good. Definitely check it out. And now we're on to sense and sensitivity. Uh, okay, so this is another <laughs> one. Just grown. <laughs> um, take it away. So, yeah, uh, Sense and Sensitivity, Season 1, Episode 6, originally aired November 9th, 1999, written by Tim Minear, uh, directed by James A. Cotner. Literally, my first note for this episode is, I strongly dislike this episode. Just mm -hmm. going to put it out there at the beginning. This one is a total skip for me. <laughs> so, as far as uh, watch or pass, again, pass. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just going to put that out there at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um. I literally did like the highest of high level notes for this one because it was painful to try to get through and I just don't like it. Um, so yeah. So remember Kate, the police officer, uh, the one who's had a grand total of about 10 minutes of screen time in the last four episodes. Mm -hmm. She's apparently working to track down some guy in a mob. Uh, she enlists the help of Angel, loses her cool in an interrogation and is forced to go to sensitivity training with a bunch of other cops. Yes. Uh, the sensitivity training is hokey, and the instructor forces everyone to hold a talking stick and share their feelings. It works a little too well and basically starts to cause chaos at the police station, with all the cops forced to go to sensitivity training, starting to lose their control of their emotions, start fights, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, long story short, turns out the sensitivity training instructor was actually a witch doctor uh, hired by Wolfram and Hart, uh, who were hired by the mob guys to get the guy out of jail slash out of trouble, the guy that Kate had been trying to track down. I think his name's like Little Johnny or something. It's it's really bad. Um, at one point, Kate uh, talks Angel into going along with 
like with her as her date to her father's retirement party. Uh, her dad also works for the police force and they have a very strange relationship. Due to her contact with the magical talking stick, uh, Kate's speech doesn't go as planned. She ends up having a breakdown, uh, talking about how bad the relationship with her father was growing up. Uh, Angel ends up confronting the witch doctor, gets exposed to the talking stick. Uh, this episode has some very funny out-of-character lines uh, from Angel, if you have the time, patience, and stomach to tolerate it. But honestly, I just find this one painful to sit through. That's it. That's all, all right. I <laughs> I just, I just, I just, I don't care. It's, it's like, at the, there's like a point at the end where Angel's talking to like a bad guy, like the mob bad guy who's got mm. Kate at freaking gunpoint. And he's like, you know, uh, you had the opportunity to be a rainbow, but instead you chose to be a pain bow. It's like, no, no, this is where I draw the line. This is it. <laughs> Yeah. Please do not make Angel say dumb, dumb lines. It's it's one of those things um, where at this point in the universe, they've established the characters in Buffy enough to the point where they can play around with how their characters act and interact with, like, band candy, you know? Yeah. Where it's fun and it's funny because you know them all so well. I think... Um, with episode six, you don't know Kate enough. Um, Angel, you do know from Buffy, but if you're just watching Angel, like, yeah, he's dark and brooding, and it's funny that he's saying these things, but the show hasn't quite earned this episode, if that no. makes sense. It does. Um, it, it really does. This is very kind of reminiscent of Band Candy, mm -hmm. where it's... Uh, it's a situation where it causes the characters to act very out of character, mm -hmm. but especially where it's mostly affecting Kate and the guys at the police station. Like you see them like jumping into fights with each other, like mm. full on fist fights. Yeah. And you're like, that seems kind of inappropriate for cops to be literally getting into fist fights with each other in the police station right. and just letting the guys out of the jail cells that, okay. Yeah. I, I can understand that's, probably out of character for them but we mm. don't know them well enough for it to be funny or for mm. it to like it just it comes off as very hokey and very cheesy and like angel has a confrontation with um with cordelia and doyle outside where they're like come on angel like jump in you know vamp face rawr yeah, go, right, go right. help and he's like he won't jump in to help and he's like you know i really feel like you guys judge me whenever i go like that <laughs> face but i'm like w why why are we wasting time listening to this conversation mm -hmm. i don't understand and i think it could have worked if it was further along in the series and you maybe had more characters on angel who are acting out of their own character you know yeah and that was more fun like cordelia is a very she doesn't express her emotions very much and perhaps having her doing that. But all in all is what I'm trying to say is the show hasn't earned the right to flip the status quo yet. They haven't established the status quo yet. You know, we're, right. we're only six episodes in. We don't, we don't know these characters enough to really appreciate this. And uh, the one big thing is it does establish Kate's and... Kate and her relationship with her father, which and her father never shows up again. No, he he will he will. Oh, does he? Do yeah, yeah. <laughs> after <laughs> I don't want to do any spoilers, but after we're done recording, we'll talk. Um, yeah, okay. So that's the one thing for that, and <laughs> I mean, I feel... Kate's not even that big of a character, like you said. She's she's yeah. hardly been in the show. Like the show's built around the three leads. And then Kate's, like, a bit player. Like, maybe if Kate had been, like, the fourth lead and they had really been, like, a team, this would hit a little harder when she has, like, this emotional moment with her father and her father yeah. is so not emotional. But it's just not there. It doesn't work for me. I gave it a four. Um, I, I'm, I can't wait to hear what you gave it. I, I tend to agree with you. It's not... Mm. I, yeah, I'll give it like a four. It's not as like cringy, making my skin crawl as I fall to pieces. 
Um, again, that's going to be my baseline, at least for right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just like, if I'm doing a, a binge watch of the series, it's not an episode that I'm going to watch. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I th- definitely not. No. And yeah, I just, especially like you said, with it being this early in the season, they have not fleshed out Kate's character enough. We don't. We haven't had a chance to know her enough yet mm-hmm. um, to actually, like, feel the weight of this episode. And, it's, and like, even in Lonely Heart, her premiere episode, mm-hmm. she didn't really talk all that much about herself. No. She's so, just the, the cop. Well, she didn't even tell Angel that she was a cop the whole time mm-hmm. they were having, like, that conversation in the bar when she was introduced. Mm-hmm. She didn't mention it. Right. So we really don't know very much about her. Whereas, like, at least in Band Candy, you knew the characters enough to know how they would react to certain situations. So when they didn't react that way, that's what, like, tipped you off that something was going on. Mm -hmm. Whereas this one, you're just like, maybe they're all just off their meds? Like, (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, I would love to have a conversation with someone in the writing room for this season and kind of (laughs) ask them, like, was Kate going to be a bigger character than she is was that like the initial intention to have kate become like a member of angel investigations become like a bigger part and it just didn't work for whatever reason because the way it is during this rewatch is she's just such a weird character in terms of how she fits into the show as a whole and this episode exemplifies that they definitely have it played as though there could have been something developing between uh, Angel and Kate. Oh, like definitely, you, yeah. You could see them kind of laying the building blocks for potentially trying to get the two of them to have a, con- uh, a, a relationship. Mm. But they just, they don't go for it. So it mm. just feels weird, especially on a rewatch <laughs> of like being like, wow, they were laying groundwork for something that spoilers never happens yeah and it's almost when you rewatch it at least for me i'm just like oh yeah kate she was a prominent player at to a certain degree um at one (laughs) point in this show like she was oh yeah uh, kate she was a person who was around yeah exactly exactly there's no one like i would say like miss calendar and buffy is a more major character than kate is an angel yes i feel like the probably should have made Kate a bigger character if you want us to care about her side stories. I mean, even like Larry in Buffy <laughs> was a bigger character than Kate was. Yeah. Hey, Larry, he had a, a whole redemption arc and died a hero. So <laughs> <laughs> I would not, I would not stand for any bad mouthing of Larry. <laughs> but it's, yeah. I mean, even Even Jonathan in the first three seasons Mm -hmm. had enough of a character arc that, like, when he comes back later, you recognize him. Right. But it also would have been very strange to have a Jonathan-centric episode in, you know, the first season after he's just a bit player. Yeah. Why? Why are we doing this? (laughs) Yeah. You know, he's definitely more of, like, the comic relief character but the sprinkle in within the first few seasons. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, those are our thoughts on, uh, on this one <laughs> sense and sensitivity. Uh, Jill, do you want to mention anything before we get on out of here with this episode? Uh, if you want to, you can hit me up on Twitter. I'm at Julian underscore Swan. That's Swan with two N's. Um, you can DM me or tweet me. I, I, I did go in and, and try to find where the DMS were. So <laughs> at least I should, in theory, see that if you try to DM me. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you if you disagree with me and think that Sense and Sensitivity is just the best episode of Angel of the entire series, just uh, let me know and, and tell me why, because yeah, I'd if, be really curious to know. There's a big defender of Sense and Sensitivity out there. I would be surprised, <laughs> but interested to hear from you. Kate is the best character ever. Yeah, so Why? Set, set of Buffy is just a Kate poster. It's like, did you get this custom made? How does this exist? <laughs> oh, man. 
But yeah, as for me, you can follow me on Twitter at the fake BMR. That's B M A R R. You can follow the channel on Twitter at WG Everything on Instagram at Wicked Good Everything on Twitch at Twitch.tv slash Wicked Good Everything and uh, I guess not TikTok anymore. It's getting closer <laughs> to being made uh, obsolete, but uh, I'm sure we'll we'll have uh, Instagram Reels. Um, We'll have stuff there. Although I didn't really like it that much when I first checked it out. Instagram needs to pick a lane. Are you short videos that show up on the Instagram feed? Are you long videos that show on show up on Instagram TV? Or are you reels, which is also just short videos, but longer than a minute, but shorter than five minutes? I don't know how to use this. This is a mess. Pick one thing and go with it. <laughs> Anyways, follow us uh, on all the various social medias, and we will see you in the next episode. The Sunnydale Review is a Wicked Good Everything production. Fan art of Buffy was created by Fishbone Art. The logo was created by Tamar Kutab. The original intro and outro song was created by Alex Carl.